Mm -hmm. Keep all that kind of food away from me. Well, then I guess these would be out of the question. What the hell is that? Putting skin singles. want to try eating it with one of these. There's lobster in these eggs? Not that much. You know, they tend to shrink in the water. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're returning to the fictional land of New York City for this part two in a ten-part Seinfeld series. Sorry for the weird hair patterns, but I just got some fresh ink. Speaking of which, first up, we are looking at pudding skin singles, something for which we are going to need neither pudding nor skin. Instead, we are going to crack open a can of coconut milk. In my mind, this was in an effort to preserve fridge life, but I'm not entirely sure if that's necessary, so just use milk if you want. To that, we're going to add two packets of gelatin that we're going to let bloom for like ten minutes. This also proved to be wholly unnecessary, but uh, I don't know, just do it if you want. And then we're adding about a half cup of unsweetened cocoa powder, giving that a tentative mix before remembering that we forgot to add sugar. I like to do a one-to-one -one ratio of cocoa powder to sugar, so I'm adding half a cup. We're just whisking that to combine. Don't worry if it's lumpy, just make sure that it's sweet enough with a middle finger taste test. And then we're bringing it on over to the stovetop, wherein we shall deposit it into a medium saucepan and apply to it medium-high heat, stirring constantly to make sure that nobody sticks or burns until we reach a bare simmer. It's gonna be kind of hard to tell when that happens, just stop stirring, and if it starts moving on its own, then you got yourself a simmer. Take it off the heat, and bring it over to a prepared parchment lined baking sheet, where we're gonna pour it out into a thin, even layer. It's pretty liquidy right now, so it shouldn't be a problem. We're just gonna use our not-tiny whisk to pop any air into bubbles, tap it out a few times to make sure that it's even, and place it uncovered into the refrigerator for at least one hour, after which time you might be delighted to find that you are rewarded with one giant pudding skin. This recipe took a bit of research. I tried initially to make traditional pudding and let it coagulate on the top, but it would just reliquify once I wrapped it up. This stuff, thanks to the gelatin, is stable, and we can cut it using a pizza cutter into pudding skin singles. I doubt that there will ever be a practical or non-disgusting use for these, but that is kind of the essence of George Costanza's ideas, practical solutions for our impractical lizard brain desires. So I'm going to use two sheets of press and seal to seal these guys into individual singles, cut them up so they are portable and ready for deployment on a moment's notice, and there you go, you will never feel homesick again the next time you order pudding at your favorite local diner. Let's put these guys in the fridge so we can shift our focus to marble rye, for which we need to start off with three and three quarter ounces of rye flour. We're gonna go ahead and dump that into the bowl of our stand mixer along with four teaspoons of plain white sugar, one packet of instant yeast, and eight ounces or one cup of lukewarm water, and then gently mix to combine. This method, courtesy of King Arthur Flour, not only helps our rye flour hydrate, making it easier to mix later on, but it also lets our yeast get a little head start in life, plus it gives us time to make another one. That's right, we gotta make two separate batches of rye dough because this is a marble rye and it requires two different kinds of rye doughs. Go figure. Once our first starter mixture has had the chance to rest for 20 minutes, we're gonna start adding the rest of the ingredients. One half cup or four ounces of sour cream added directly to the bowl, and then we're measuring out 10 ounces of bread flour, to which we're gonna add a teaspoon and a half of kosher salt and two tablespoons of vital wheat gluten, which is optional. It's just going to help improve the bread's texture. We are whisking that to combine before dumping it all into the mixing bowl and affixing dough hooks, dropping down our stand mixer and mixing on medium-low speed until a smooth, tacky ball of dough forms. About three to five minutes. Don't worry if it's a little sticky. It will become more workable after its first rise. Speaking of which, we're going to cover it with plastic wrap and let it rise for one hour until it's not quite doubled in size but pretty puffed up. Then we are repeating the same process with the second yeast mixture. Let's see, it was um, 10 ounces of bread flour, uh, two tablespoons of vital wheat gluten, a teaspoon and a half of salt. Ah yes, but this time we're adding two tablespoons of unsweetened cocoa powder. This is the dough from which the darker half of the marble rye will come from, or something, I don't, I don't know. Either way, we're adding two tablespoons of cocoa powder in the second stage of adding the dry ingredients, which is going to give us a nice darker brown dough, which is subject to the same covered one hour rise, after which time these guys should have puffed up significantly. So we are turning them out onto a well-floured work surface, and then shaping what's known as a plaited loaf. I don't know if I'm saying that right, I only know the term from the Great British Baking Show. We are starting by punching all the air out of the dough and then folding them into cylindrical shapes, which we can then roll from the center outward into sort of baguettes. The dough at this point should feel soft, supple, 
workable, like your beard after a good oiling and brushing. Then once we've got these guys rolled out to evenly sized baguettes, we are crossing swords, so to speak, and braiding them into a plaited loaf once we've pulled up a video of Paul Hollywood doing it on YouTube first. There we go. I would try to describe this process to you, but frankly, he does a way better job and his version is still really hard to understand. So check out the card that pops up right now for a link to that video so you can get confused just like me. Anyway, once you've got this stupid thing all braided up, we're gonna put it on a parchment lined baking sheet. Give it a good brush down with vegetable oil before covering with plastic wrap and letting rise for about another hour. We want it again, not quite double in size, maybe like one and a half times its original size. Close enough. So we're gonna unwrap this guy and give him a good brush down with a whole beaten egg. And then place him into an awaiting 350 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 35 minutes. Mmm, look at that. Not quite right. We want to make sure that it's registering about 205 degrees Fahrenheit at its thickest point before letting it cool completely about two hours before cutting in. And I wasn't super happy with this loaf. It rose out instead of up, I think because I just made it too big. But the crust was good, the crumb was good, so I decided to try again, this time making two different loaves out of the same amount of dough. So I'm dividing the light and dark doughs in half and using those halves to make another plaited loaf, which turned out half the size. Perfect. Then I took the other halves of the dough and decided to make a spiral loaf by rolling them out flat and rolling one into the other, and then placing the whole affair into a greased and parchment-lined loaf pan. Same story as before, oil them down, wrap them up, let them rise for one hour. Then once they've about doubled in size, into a 350 degree Fahrenheit oven they go. This time I am skipping the egg wash process because I think this also contributed to their deflation. This is gonna make them come out of the oven a little paler, but not to worry. A quick brush down with melted butter while they are still hot will surely cure them of all their ails. Place them on a wire rack and let them cool completely for at least two hours, plenty of time to go bite into a big hunk of cheese like it's an apple, and then take them off the rack and let's slice them up and see what we got inside. Definitely a little bit better rise on the smaller loaf. I could definitely see myself constructing a sandwich out of that, but more so with this loaf, with his hot nasty spiral. I placed the loaf in the pan a little bit unevenly so it rose unevenly, but with just a little bit of practice you're going to make yourself the perfect marble rye, which this was pretty close. It joined the clean slice club. Now, last but not least, it's time for the more opulent side of George Costello. Kansas culinary glossary, lobster scrambled eggs. Given the context of the episode, this was most likely made with leftover lobster, so I'm going to quickly boil a small, fresh lobster tail for about six minutes and plunge into an ice bath. Then, once cool enough to handle, I'm going to drain it out and cut it out of its shell. Make sure to remove the vein, and then we're going to chop it into tiny little pieces. We are, after all, trying to trick Jerry's kosher girlfriend into tasting the forbidden fruit of the sea. We're then going to beat up three eggs, into which we're going to dump about four or five finely minced chives beat to combine, and then we're headed over to the stovetop, where we are melting two tablespoons of butter in a large nonstick pan. We're going to add our chilled, quote-unquote, leftover lobster, just heating through in the barely sizzling butter for like 30 seconds, before utilizing my new favorite weapon in the war against eggs, chopsticks. Chopsticks are great for agitating the eggs constantly in a nonstick pan without scratching up the pan, which is going to help us make a very, very small, tender, creamy curd, which when you're serving something as luxuriant as lobster, you want to make sure that you achieve. So after cooking over medium low heat for a minute or two. Once you get the eggs to just barely where you want them, add two or three tablespoons of sour cream, a little pinch of kosher salt, some freshly ground pepper, and I think these eggs are going to go really well with some of our freshly made marble rye. So toast up a slice, dump your eggs on top, garnish with a single chive if desired, and look at that, you can just barely see the lobster. Perfect. But you can certainly taste the lobster. Picture lobster macaroni and cheese, but with eggs instead of macaroni and cheese. Tempting, no? In fact, the only thing that I think this needs to enter the clean plate club is a pudding skin single. I think the richness of the chocolate and the creaminess of the coconut, I'm just kidding. I would never do that, though I would not put it past George.